Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming on this beautiful evening. Uh, should we hold class out on the lawn today? Um, um, so uh, I think before I jump into the nitrogen world, I want to say a little bit about who I am and the institution that I work for. I know um, many of you are longtime residents here and know all of this, but some of you may not be. So uh, those who already know this, please bear with me. Of course, the, the, the community of Woods Hole has numerous institutions in it. Uh, USGS is here, NOAA is here, um, the Woods Hole Oceanographic, the Marine Biological Lab, uh, the Woods Hole Research Center, the Sea Education Association. Have I left any out? Um, fisheries. <laughs> well, fisheries and part of NOAA. Um, and, um, so we have a, a Woods Hole Consortium of, of groups uh, of that work together. We also have a diversity initiative that those institutions are collaborating together. Um, I may offend a few people in the audience with this, but I'm really just kidding. Um, that I like to say that you know, Marie, uh, the MBL is the oldest. They're about 125 years old. I think they're having an anniversary. Uh, Hui is the biggest. They have about 900 or so employees but we're the best. <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, we just yesterday was announced a, um, a survey of think tanks that have influence on climate change policy in the world. Uh, and we ranked number three, right behind Harvard and Princeton. Um, now, I did say climate change, uh, but, and that is certainly one of the things that we work on. And nitrogen is related to climate change, and I'll mention that briefly here. But we work on many other things as well. We try to work on areas of the world that are on the cusp of change, where science can inform policy, can make a difference in helping us figure out how to deal with those issues. So we have a number of people working in the Arctic, which is the epicenter of climate change. That's where things are happening the fastest. We have a number of people working on tropical deforestation and forest conservation. We have a number of people specializes in using satellites uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, orbit the Earth and provide images of the earth that we can use to track the rate at which forests regrow, forests are cut, and so forth. Um, and uh, we have people working on the great rivers of the world that drain those great forested areas. So we have people working in uh, South America, in Africa, in uh, uh, Indonesia. Um, and we do work here at home as well. And I'm going to try to relate this talk uh, to what we experience here at home Nitrogen is certainly an issue for those of you who are residents here and our taxpayers here uh, should be on your radar if it isn't already. Um, as to who we are in terms of where we are located, um, we are the institution that's right across the street from tree treetops on Woods Hole Road that has the wind turbine. And lately we've been trying to keep the wind turbine under the radar uh, in this town. <laughs> Uh, you might understand why. Uh, ours is, uh, produces about one sixteenth the amount of energy as the ones that have been so con excuse me, controversial. But we do try to uh, walk the walk as well as talk the talk in that we generate through our wind turbine and our solar panels uh, more than half of the energy that we use. Uh, and we have a denitrification system which uh, treats the nitrogen in our waste that's underneath the wild uh, flower prairie that's sort of on our front lawn as you drive by. Um, there's not much to show about a denitrification system. We can walk on the top of it and I can show you where the pipe comes out that you know exchanges gases and so forth. But other than that, it's covered with pretty flowers right now. So the topic today is solutions for a nitrogen-soaked world. Um, solutions is part of what we try to do with all of our science. It's uh, it's important to identify problems, but it's also try to, to do it in a way that we can help identify what the potential solutions are. We don't advocate the solutions. We don't um, go to Washington and lobby for specific laws. We don't, uh, uh, we, we don't litigate in court. Um, but we do identify the range of options that's available and try to explain what the consequences, intended and unintended, consequences of those options will be. And nitrogen is one of those. Uh, 
because uh, the world has, uh, depends on it so much for food. And in this graph, um, I'm showing uh, the human population in millions of people, so a thousand million is one billion. Uh, in the, about in the industrial, industrial revolution era, there was about a billion people on, on the earth, and we are now have exceeded seven billion. This is kind of an old slide. We're up here above seven billion right now. Uh, and that has been made possible in large part by the fact that we figured out how to make synthetic forms of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, that uh, is, uh, we estimate that uh, roughly half of the world is nourished by crops that are grown using synthetic fertilizers. Where did that uh, come from? Well, this red line shows what we call the Haber-Bosch process. That's, those are two German um, uh, engineers that invented this. They invented it at around the time of World War I. And it wasn't an altruistic reason that they invented this. It was because Germany was concerned that they may not have access to nitrates from Chile, which are the main deposits of nitrates. And nitrates, of course, are important in munitions. And they thought that if they were cut off from the source of nitrates, that they would be in a disadvantage in a global war, specifically World War I. And their engineers invented a method in which if you take the air, which is 80% nitrogen, it's totally harmless. We breathe it in and out. We don't use any of it. We can't use any of it. We're incapable of using the nitrogen gas that's around us. But they figured out a way of taking that air, compressing it, putting it under high pressure and high temperature, and converting it to a form that plants and animals can use and it also can be used for munitions. Well, it was used primarily for munitions for a long time until after, sometime after World War II is when it started being used in a big way for synthetic fertilizer. Um, and so sort of literally uh, swords were turned into plowshares um, in that this technology was used to allow agricultural expansion and while um, the human population was expanding all through that time, as people were generally better nourished, as they become, became more um, affluent with the Industrial Revolution, the real, real takeoff um, was uh, after World War II. And now um, China has exceeded the United States as the biggest user of nitrogen fertilizer. And so it is continuing to go uh, much higher because uh, the Chinese uh, are improving their nutritional status, which is a good thing. Um, so I want to emphasize that while there are a lot of unintended consequences of, um, of our excess use of nitrogen, which I'm going to be talking about, it's generally a good thing in that we are better nourished, while there are still about a billion people undernourished on this planet, but on average we are better nourished than uh, humans have ever been in the history of humankind. And uh, many of us can uh, devote our time to business, the arts, to leisure, uh, because we don't have to grow our own food, because uh, we have uh, a uh, farming system, for good or bad, uh, that is highly productive, uh, in which a very few number of people work on our farming systems, at least in the developed world, and produce a lot of food for the rest of us. Unfortunately, only a small fraction of the nitrogen that they put on their crops uh, ends up in our mouths to nourish us. So this is an example that if a farmer were to put 100 units of nitrogen, we could call it pounds per acre or whatever units you want, some of it gets lost at various steps along the way. The crop maybe takes up about half of it. The other half goes into the soil or gets washed into groundwater or rivers and streams. Um, some of it is lost in the harvest phase. Some of it is lost in producing that into food. And finally, out of these 100 units, about 14 of them end up in the food we eat. If you're a vegetarian. Uh, the other part of this is that while the human population has been increasing very rapidly, uh, livestock population has increased even more rapidly. So the red line is the increase in meat consumption. 
And this is happening even more now in China as uh, more and more Chinese uh, becoming affluent enough to have more meat in their diet. And the impact of that is, um, well, before I get there, um, just to show you where uh, that increasing animal consumption of protein is going. Actually, um, in the European Union and the United States, there has been an increase since 1970 to 2003. It's not projected to increase much more for us going to 2030, but where the really big increase is expected to occur is this bar for China uh, and India and the rest of the world combined. Um, so there's going to be tremendous demand for feedstock, for um, livestock to feed people. Um, and if you do that on a per person basis, actually we are still eating more meat per person. We're still getting more supersized as we go to the, the restaurants and get supersized portions served to us. Um, but it, it's ex particularly huge change in per capita meat consumption in places like China. And the problem is that even less of the nitrogen that is put on the farmer's field ends up in the human palate when you consume um, meat because again you get some wastage on the farm, some not all of it goes into the crop, um, and then some of it goes into the animal feed, but this is the part where, pardon the expression, manure happens. Um, and uh, so a lot of nitrogen goes into that form. Now some of that gets recycled back up if the farmer is using the manure as a source of nutrients. But unfortunately I'll show you in a moment that that's not often not the case anymore. And so then uh, a small fraction of that ends up actually in the cow or the pig or the chicken. Um, and then uh, there's more wastage as we consume it. Um, and so only four of those original 100 units. And so we have a very productive system that nourishes ver us very well, but it's not a particularly efficient system. A large fraction of that nitrogen goes out into the environment where it has unintended consequences. You can think of this as a metaphor of nitrogen flowing through a pipe or two pipes. There's this one pipe to produce crops, some of which we eat directly when we eat bread or vegetables or whatever uh, that's vegetarian. Um, and some of it goes to animal production and then we consume that. But each of these pipes uh, through which the nitrogen is flowing, and that's true whether it's coming from synthetic fertilizers or from natural nitrogen fixation by crops that, uh, uh, like soybeans that produce their own nitrogen fixation, or from manures. In all of those cases, these pipes are leaky pipes. And so think of these leaks as little holes in the pipe, and the more that flows through, the more important the leak is. So if you have a leak in your pipe at home, but it's in a bathroom that you never use, right? You don't worry about fixing it until you've got a guest come that's going to start using it, right? But if it's a place that you're using all the time, that leak is really important. So we have leaks of various gases that come out, like ammonia, nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, and the harmless dinitrogen gas. And we have leaks of some that goes into surface water and groundwaters, various forms of nitrogen um, that you may be familiar with if you're paying attention to the news here in Falmouth. And this has all kinds of unintended consequences. Some of those gaseous forms uh, result in the formation of smog or haze. Uh, some of them then rain down, downwind on forests and, and, and oceans and lakes and cause acidification. Um, and nutrient imbalances. Um, some of that nitrogen is a good thing and it helps the trees grow better, but if it's too much of it, uh, it can actually cause the tree dieback. Um, another form, nitrous oxide, is now, now that we've uh, been successful globally in controlling uh, emissions of chlorofluorocarbons, that uh, ozone-eating uh, 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 form of gas that is um, that we debated you probably remember 20 or so years ago, um, we've done a good job of reducing that. Now nitrous oxide is the dominant ozone-eating uh, human-made substance um, that we need to be worried about. 
Uh, it's one of the nitrogen gases is also a potent uh, heat trapping gas. It's the third most important greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide and methane. And it also has a very long half-life in the atmosphere. So that means that emissions that we're putting up there now will be there. Um, uh, half of the same amount that we're putting up now will still be there about 110 years from now. So we're talking about a generational impact. And this is what we're familiar, familiar with in Falmouth, that too much of this good thing uh, ends up with algal blooms, some kind, sometimes harmful algal blooms. Uh, when the algae die, uh, they decompose, that uses up the oxygen, and then you get fish kills. And some of it washes up on shore, and you have noxious smells like uh, the rotten egg odor from um, hydrogen sulfide, and so on. So there are a number of unintended consequences. Um, so we've, why haven't you heard about this? Well, you have if you're a resident of Falmouth because it's been in the newspapers. But a lot of places I go, people haven't heard about it. And, you know, they've heard about biodiversity. And this is, I don't particularly like this graph, but it's, it's gotten a lot of play in the scientific literature, a paper in, in Nature that came out and saying, th these are the planetary limits. This is a diagram supposedly showing the planetary limits and the, the major threats to them. And we've already exceeded planetary limits in biodiversity. In other words, species are going extinct uh, at a rate um, faster than at any time since the decline of the dinosaurs. And we are the cause of it through, due to um, decreasing habitat. Uh, climate change. Uh, in this case, we haven't quite got to a planetary limit. Uh, according to these um, um, specialists, but we are certainly moving quickly in that direction. But nitrogen, they actually put here as the one that we've exceeded. Um, these are highly uncertain, and these are kind of arbitrary, kind of uh, nebulous limits. But the point is, this, even though it isn't getting a lot of attention uh, in the public literature, in terms of the impact that humans have changed on our environment, nitrogen is certainly ranks up there among the highest. As I said, nitrous oxide is uh, now the most important uh, ozone-depleting substance. We did a good job in, uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, chlorofluorocarbons were the major emissions. Thanks to the Montreal Protocol, they are now uh, very low, and uh, we're on a path towards healing of the ozone hole. Uh, but uh, nitrous oxide emissions are going up. Uh, this is what they are now. They've been going up, and those are the projections. And because they're related to food, uh, it's quite likely that that will continue to go up. So that is something that we have to be uh, quite concerned about uh, so as not to um, uh, not benefit from all the effort we've done in reducing chlorofluorocarbons. As I said, some of the uh, nitrogen gases are involved in producing the bad ozone, the stuff that's down here at the ground level that we, believe, we breathe, and that uh, has uh, human uh, health, respiratory impacts. Fine particulate matter, is some of it is made up of nitrogen and nitrogen dioxide. These are pollutants that um, uh, are um, uh, catalytic converters on our uh, cars do a pretty good job of eliminating, but there are um, still sources of them from other sectors. Um, the ozone down here where we breathe not only affects human health, but it also affects crop productivity. Um, and as I said, as it rains down from the sky and it impacts the forests, this is an example in California of using uh, indicators. Uh, this case of lichens growing on the side of trees is an indicator of how much nitrogen it's being received. They're very sensitive to it. This is a nitrate in, drink, in groundwater. Areas that have been influenced, usually downwind of the major population areas um, where there's been excess nitrogen that has cha is changing the nature of those ecosystems. Another concern is our own drinking water. Now, fortunately, um, in this country and in, in, in Europe, um, uh, after, I believe it was after World War II, um, there were, a, well, unfortunately, there were some high-profile cases of what's called blue baby syndrome. The long name for it, if we can pronounce it, is methylglobinemia. Um, and it's, uh, if babies ingest too much nitrate, particularly if it's water in, in, in formula, 
uh, that has too much nitrate, then they can't absorb the oxygen uh, that they need to absorb, and so they turn blue. It's called blue baby syndrome. And at that time, we didn't have the Environmental Protection Agency. There wasn't a particularly sophisticated methodology for epidemiology. Um, and so the health officials at the time just said, well, what are, the, what are the concentrations that we think these babies were consuming? And we'll pick a concentration that's about, I forget what the number is. I'm going to guess it was 10 times higher or something like that, uh, you know, a margin of error. And we'll say that's going to be our drinking water standard. And we followed that in this country, and that's good, and we hardly ever hear of blue baby syndrome anymore. And as a result, there hasn't been as much research on other aspects of nitrate in drinking water, but that is starting to come out now. So nitrate, whether it comes in our drinking water or also nitrite or nitrate in our diet, such as from bacon or from green leafy vegetables, we ingest it. In the mouth, it's converted to this other form called nitrite. We, uh, inject, in the gut, it's uh, converted to another thing that's called an N-nitroso compound. And in every animal model so far, N-nitroso compounds have been shown to be carcinogenic. Um, it's hard to prove that for humans uh, because you can't do experiments on humans very easily. Uh, it's also complicated by it's made worse by uh, diets rich in red meat. But it seems to be not as much of a risk if you have a diet rich in vitamin C. So take a vitamin C pill when you have your hamburger. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if that's a good advice. I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor. But um, anyway, um, just to show how complicated uh, it is to do epidemiology to know just how important this risk is. Uh, but we do know uh, the World Health Organization has, in, has stated that ingested nitrate or nitrate under conditions that result in this endogenous nitrosation, that's what I was talking about, formation in the gut, is probably carcinogenic to humans. And they have various different rates. Definitely, probably, there's evidence for it, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also uh, growing evidence in a paper just published in the last couple of days of studies of uh, pregnant women um, uh, with different sources of drinking water uh, including bottled water, uh, wells, um, municipal water, and showing an association of uh, nitrate consumption at levels below the EPA limit with birth defects. And of course, as you might expect, the areas that have the biggest problem of nitrate in drinking water or in groundwater are places that are rich in agriculture, the American Midwest, uh, um, uh, Maryland, uh, the Central Basin of California. Um, and these, the red colors, are places that where nitrate in near surface groundwater, this would be the, not the really deep groundwater that municipal, uh, municipalities draw their drinking water from, but the more shallow groundwater that a homeowner would be likely drinking, drawing their water from if they ha are getting their water from a well. Um, and there are a number of places where it exceeds the EPA limit of 10 and a whole lot of places where it's uh, above 1 or 5 to 10. And so some of this evidence is now coming through that uh, even though the limit of 10 was very good for eliminating blue baby syndrome, we need to be thinking about other health impacts. Unfortunately, um, it isn't confined in our current system to the grain belt. This is where we produce, say, most of our corn in Iowa. But now, due to a combination of, of laws and incentives um, in places like North Carolina, uh, there's now a lot of hog production going on in North Carolina. So the grain is grown in Iowa. It's shipped to, hog pr to, to produce hogs there um, in these big, uh, big uh, animal confinement operations. And again, that's uh, where the manure happens. But unfortunately, the manure now is too heavy and wet to make it um, uh, economically viable to ship it back to use as a nutrient to grow the corn. Um, so instead, um, uh, this is the hog operation, uh, an example of the hog operation. Instead, they spray the uh, effluent from the hog operations back onto forests, onto cornfields, and in some cases, they're quite close to some of the residential areas 
uh, in here. And uh, uh, people can't put their laundry out to dry. Uh, now, we're more familiar in these parts of um, uh, uh, this sort of issue of, of beaches being closed down on occasion um, uh, because of, of uh, toxicity, um, and, and that is related to excess nutrients in many cases. A healthy, if you're a snorkeler and you were in, this would be what you would see in a healthy seagrass bed. You can see that there's sand there. Uh, but still plants growing, um, and uh, the water is clear. This is habitat, good habitat for reproduction for shellfish. This is what happens when you have too many nutrients. There are lots of plants. Plants love nutrients, uh, but there are too many of them, and it's murky, and there's no longer any um, uh, uh, access to the, the sand. So this is not good shellfish habitat. And this is a phenomenon that's now happening all over the world. It isn't just here in Falmouth, but each one of these dots is a place that is referred to as a hypoxic zone. In other words, low oxygen. Eutrophic means too many nutrients. And these are the places that we know about. Well, all up and down the East Coast and the Gulf Coast of the US, all along uh, in Western Europe, and increasingly more so in China and, and um, Japan. And we're starting to even to see it in other um, developing regions across the world. So this is truly a global phenomenon. And we see it coming, happening here at home. This is an example of a picture taken about a, a decade ago on Wakoit Bay of an algal bloom that washed up on the shore. This is not brown sand. This is dead algae. Um, and as that decomposes, of course, it stinks uh, to high heaven. Um, and this is becoming increasingly common. And it has to do with, of course, our very source of sustenance on the Cape of tourism. Uh, tourists don't want to come and walk on that beach, I assure you. Um, as I said, not everything is bad. We are better nourished on average than uh, ever in human history. This is an example. It's a really interesting book about um, the Hungry Planet, What the World Eats. You can see the pictures of bugs that people eat in various parts of the world and all kinds of crazy things. But this is what Germans eat. And isn't it nice? I, I hope I don't offend anybody of German heritage, but how they have everything so neatly arranged. And one of my, one of my German colleagues says there's not nearly enough beer, so this can't really be an average German family. But boy, they've got a lot of food there for, for a week. And uh, here's an American family. Of course, we have a whole lot of pizza, takeout, you know, uh, soft drinks. Um, but actually, we're pretty well nourished. And unfortunately, I make jest of this, but it really is a very serious situation because while we have plenty to eat and we have this problem of excess nutrients, there's a big part of the world that doesn't have enough. And this is the food that this uh, Somalian family will consume in one week that they've assembled here. And notice in the background, it looks like they're maybe in a refugee camp. But one of the problems that they have is that in these areas, they are harvesting more. They're taking more off the land than they're putting back on. They can't afford fertilizers. What animals they do have that produce manure are poorly fed themselves, and so they don't have manure that is really rich and balanced in nutrients. Um, and so they're very low input agriculture, and they're harvesting more. So the site becomes more and more degraded. And over time, this is just maps of the red color showing countries where there are nutrient depletions, and it's become worse over time. Um, uh, so this is something that is growing a phenomenon, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in some other parts of the world. And unfortunately, this leads to sort of a vicious circle, that if you have fewer nutrients, and so you're not putting as much in, you end up with bare soil that causes erosion, um, that requires the people to clear more land, um, so that you lose biodiversity, you lose forests or savannas. That causes environmental degradation. Declining crop productivity means malnutrition and illness. And in many cases, labor there, unlike here, labor is a key component of productivity. Um, uh, and so with declining labor, uh, declining productivity, you end up with this vicious circle. We know how to change that. We know that um, 
we can change uh, an initial investment in, in, in nutrients, whether it's synthetic fertilizers, organic nutrients, or whatever that we can get there, can make a huge difference in improving crop productivity. By the way, just to put this in perspective, going from none to 50 kilograms per hectare, the average Iowa farmer would be using 150, and the average Iowa farmer might be getting something like 10 tons per hectare. Um, but even increase, tripling their uh, increase, uh, tripling their production can make a huge difference in terms of their nutrition, in terms of the amount of money they have um, to buy clothes, uh, school books for their kids, and so forth. So what are the trends uh, of where things are going? Um, and I'm borrowing a few slides here from Jason Clay. I want to acknowledge that. They will um, be interspersed here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, population in the next um, <coughs> 40 years, 35, 40 years, is going to grow 2 to 3 billion more people. Good news is that income will probably increase. Consumption will increase. There will be more consumption of animal protein. People will be better nourished on average. Uh, but that means more pressure. Uh, and more need for resources like land and for resources like nitrogen and water. About 70% 70 70 of the people will live in cities. As many people as are alive today will be living in cities then. Uh, so this means we'll be concentrating nutrients where we eat, and so the need for figuring out good ways to dispose them is important. Um, this is a projection of, from uh, an FAO study of a hopeful projection of how um, in the green line, here we are, kilocalories per person per day, uh, it has been increasing and hopefully it will continue to increase. Uh, the millions of malnourished people hopefully will decrease and the percent who are malnourished will hopefully uh, decrease in, these are in developing countries. These are optimistic uh, scenarios but they are ones that we are using as optimistic scenarios to say, well, if that comes true, how much nitrogen demand will there be? And now how much nitrous oxide will be produced? And how much ozone will be depleted? And how much will the groundwater be contaminated? And so on and so forth. Um, of course, it's possible that these people won't be as well nourished, and then we won't have as much pollution problem. But I'd prefer to assume that we're going to make progress in nourishing people. So we have to do both. Um, the developing world per capita meat consumption, it's still going up uh, in the developed world. That's us. Uh, but the developing world, it's going up faster. Uh, and this is a projection that by 2030, maybe they will have caught up to about half as much as we consume per day. But because there are so many more of them, if you look at total meat consumption, in other words, the amount per person times the number of people, uh, they will surpass the amount that is consumed in the developed world. So, um, you know, what is the shape of things to come and how are we going to uh, deal with this issue where um, it's, we are in some parts of the world we don't have enough and in other parts of the world we have too much. Um, and that is the nature of the challenges that we're dealing with. So to grow more food, we're going to need more land. That's one approach. And this is an example of one of the places that we work in Brazil. This is a soybean field. Most of these soybeans are being shipped uh, out through. Um, there's now ports on the Amazon River that can go out to the Atlantic and then through the Panama Canal and off to China to feed the pigs that the Chinese are now eating more commonly. Uh, this is the forest that's left next door to it. Um, and we are working with the foresters, or with the landowners, uh, the ranchers, on figuring out ways to conserve large tracts of forests um, and uh, where, the, where are the best places to put the agriculture and how can it be done with the least impact. But it's not going to be no impact. It's still a loss of habitat. Um, <clears throat> And we need to do it intelligently, because if you convert that land and you don't manage that land properly, it becomes degraded lands. And then you have to go cut down some others. And as the point I made, healthy soils, usually you find 
Where there are unhealthy soils, you find unhealthy people as well. So this isn't all about tree hugging. This is also about helping people. So we have to kind of shift our thinking. And away from just maximizing our production, let's get the biggest production we can. You know, competitions for the biggest pumpkin, competitions for the most amount of uh, bushels of corn per acre. We still need to think about productivity and what, and making sure the farmer makes a good living and wants to farm. But let's talk about optimizing. How much production can you do for the least amount of pollution? How much profit can you make for the least amount of pollution? Um, this is uh, a number of different organizations have worked on this. Uh, um, I've been involved in uh, uh, this particular report, uh, Our Nutrient World, How to Produce More Food and Energy with Less Pollution. I like to make a shortcut for that, mofo lo po, just what we need to remember. You know? Uh, and nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, I haven't mentioned phosphorus, but that's another important nutrient that we have to be managing, um, are keys um, for how we can do that because it's absolutely essential for crop productivity. It's essential for our health, uh, but it also has unintended consequences on the environment if we don't manage it properly. This report come up, came up with nine different uh, recommendations. I won't go through all of them, but they're about improving efficiency on in, for the farmer, that's part of it, and figuring out how we give farmers incentives and knowledge to be able to do that. There is some opportunity in transportation and industry. Um, there are still some forms of, uh, you know, we still don't completely haven't eliminated NOx emissions from automobiles and from electric generation and so forth. Uh, that technology really is there that we could do that. Uh, improving uh, uh, reducing waste, and I'm going to be talking about that some in a little bit. Um, and also, actually, I'll be getting into the end about um, changing human patterns. And so this isn't all about what somebody else can do. It's also about what we can do. Waste. About one out of three calories that are produced by our farmers are wasted in one way or another. A couple of different ways. Um, in Europe and North America, uh, there's about 30-some, 30 33% waste. Very little of it is in the green colors, which is processing, harvesting, and agriculture. This is the food I'm talking about, not the nitrogen, although the, nitrogen contains, the food contains nitrogen. Most of the waste occurs in the consumption. In other words, we leave food on our plates. We get served too much, and um, you know, we're just wasteful. Uh, in Africa, it's just the opposite. They waste very little. Uh, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer there, uh, they were eating the chicken bones. Um, I never ate a chicken bone, but um, uh, they eat uh, just about everything. But um, there's a tremendous amount of waste in the field because they don't have good ways of storing. So rats, um, uh, uh, fungus. Um, you know, an interesting aside is the cell phone has revolutionized that. Now, how does the cell phone make a difference? When I was there in the late 70s and early 80s, there were no cell phones. The farmers had to wait until uh, a merchant came with a truck. And it was a great hullabaloo in the village. Everybody came out. The merchant was there to buy uh, crops. And they didn't have much choice but to just sell them at whatever that merchant was offering because they didn't know if there was going to be another truck or when it was going to come or what price it was going to offer. And they could either let, take the risk of letting their food waste and hope that another truck would come with a better price or sell it to this merchant. Now, all across Africa, even in remote villages, um, there's somebody with a cell phone that you can pay a little bit to use a cell phone to call up to the nearby town and find out what's the price for this product and when's the next truck coming out? Um, so an investment that was made, I think you could trace it back to Apollo, to, to Sputnik, an investment that was made in science and technology with not that intention, but in order to miniaturize electronics to be able to put man on the moon, we now have miniaturized that to the point that we can have peasant farmers in the middle of Africa with access to a technology that allows them to avoid some waste. 
So a lot of these problems are not insurmountable problems, but they're still big problems that we need to deal with. Here's just some pictures, examples of a waste as a result of um, poor storage bins. Now there are new technologies that are accessible, cheap enough that farmers can use, that keep the rats out, and so on. And then there are the choices that we can make. This is an example of uh, different kinds of foods that, you, that uh, we have in our diet. And this is the greenhouse gas um, footprint of those foods. And the same would be true pretty much if we just talked about the nitrogen footprint. Um, there are, I'm not suggesting that we all have to become vegetarians. If I went around the country saying that, I wouldn't get invited back very often, I don't think. Um, but what I am suggesting is that we manage portion size and frequency. Um, um, uh, so, and consider a, a mix. So chicken and fish um, uh, have lower footprints, uh, less amount of energy needed to produce them than does red meat. I'm not suggesting that you can't have a steak or a hamburger, but I'm suggesting that mix your sources of, of protein and manage uh, foods, um, uh, 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 portion sizes, and you too can contribute to the solution. Um, this is just an example of um, that uh, gas nitrous oxide that I referred to, which is one of the leaks of that leaky pipe. It's uh, up here. So a study that I was involved in recently looking at how atmospheric nitrous oxide is just going up and up and up. Um, this projection here, the blue line, is business as usual if we don't do anything as we need use more nitrogen fertilizers to feed more people as the human population grows, as they become better nourished. Um, this is the way that nitrous oxide will just keep going up. It's a heat trapping gas. It destroys ozone. What about these various different options? And don't worry about these thing called RCP. That's uh, jargon in its uh, representative concentration pathway. It's something that the um, climate change negotiators are looking at various scenarios. But this is easier to understand. A scenario in which we eat in the developed world, we go back to eating about an amount of eat meat that we were eating in 1970. Now, I don't recall in 1970 feeling that I wasn't getting enough meat. But um, that is, if we go back to that level, uh, we could reduce this substantially. Uh, or if we put all the burden on the farmer to improve agricultural efficiency by 50%, we could also reduce it substantially. There are some other sectors, like uh, there's a little bit coming from nylon production and a few other transportation sectors. They have, that would have very little added uh, effect over just uh, agricultural efficiency. But really, to get to this trajectory of it flattening out, which is what the uh, dotted yellow line is, uh, to get it to start to flatten out in the middle part of the century, we have to do all of the above. So it isn't just the farmer's problem. It isn't just our problem. It's all of us working together to figure out how to solve this problem. And this is what I mean by trying to bring the science to the policy to the decision makers, and the decision makers include you and me. This is an example of what the farmer could do, where um, uh, some scientists said to the farmers, OK, let us rent your farm. We're going to manage it for a while. We're going to do the things that we know um, are possible, regardless of the cost, and we're going to measure the cost. And the width of this uh, bar is how much nitrogen they were able to reduce, keep from going into the stream, Cedar Creek in uh, Iowa. So some things like just reducing the amount of nitrogen that they added to the corn, uh, constructing some wetlands that uh, intercepts the nitrogen before it gets to the river. Um, those things were relatively cheap, less than $5 per kilogram removed. There's some other things that are much more expensive, like applying the fertilizer in the fall. You know, it's a shame. They apply the fertilizer in the fall. It sits there all winter long. Um, and, so, and then when it starts to warm up and it's wet in the spring, it's just ideal for the, these organisms called denitrifying bacteria to, to use it or for it to be washed away in the, in the stream. But the reason they apply it in the fall is that it's so much more expensive to apply it in the spring. It's wet. It's hard to get tractors out there. You might have to use aircraft. Um, so 
Uh, this is the kind of information that allows us to figure out what sorts of interventions would work. We call this a cost curve. So what are the interventions that will work? And let's think about it from the point of view of the farmer as well, because they are thinking about what the cost is going to be for sure. Bringing it close to home, I hope many of you recognize this in East Falmouth. And um, uh, here it's not so much um, uh, agriculture, but um, that we have so much housing in this area. Um, the low-hanging fruit, nevertheless, even though we have a tremendous cost ahead of us one way or another, whether it's going to be sewering or um, other uh, uh, compost toilets or whatever it's going to be, uh, denitrification systems, it's, um, there's going to have to be change. It's probably going to cost money. It's certainly going to have to require change of some habits. Um, but one of the low-hanging fruits that the community here in Falmouth has been very effective at in terms of getting banks and uh, a lot of homeowners associations to reduce the amount of uh, fertilizer that they apply to their lawns. But the town also uh, passed an ordinance um, regulating the amount of fertilizer that any homeowner could apply within so many feet of, the, of, a, of a water body. Well, that was challenged, and the uh, Attorney General has reversed that uh, ordinance here in, in, in Falmouth. It probably will go to the state legislature, and maybe it'll get taken care of there. But that's an example of how even a low-hanging fruit of trying to reduce the amount of fertilizer that we use for our lawns meets resistance. Um, so that's, uh, but again, I think getting the information out uh, in, to uh, the decision makers and to the voters, I think is important in that regard. We can think about uh, managing the landscape in the broad sense. This came from a workshop that we held a couple of years ago in Rhode Island to get engineers and biologists, both aquatic and terrestrial, together to talk about how can we sort of plan the landscape so that you have uh, industry and you have urban areas, you have rural areas, um, you have farms, there are wetlands that intercept um, some of the nitrogen running off of these farms and animal production systems. Um, some of the people at MBL here are doing experiments with these trenches of wood chips that can inter, uh, uh, intercept uh, the nitrogen and other nutrients before it gets to the uh, water. Uh, riparian zone forested areas along the way that intercept some of it. Uh, and we've brought in industry. Um, this is um, something that's come out of the fertilizer industry that they call the four R's. Um, it's not reading, writing, arithmetic. It's uh, applying fertilizer at the right rate, at the right time, in the right place. Oh, and also the right source. And they're showing how if you get all those things right, you can consider uh, a healthy environment, the productivity and productivity and the economics, the, um, does that say durability for the farmer, and then all the sort of externalities for the rest of society, um, biodiversity, uh, water yield, uh, nutrient balance, soil erosions. And so the fertilizer industry, I believe most of them, not all of them, but they're certainly moving in this direction of seeing that they need to be part of the solution as well. And in fact, um, one, uh, this summer, uh, if you care to join me, I hear Kansas City is lovely in August. Um, <laughs> we're taking this to the farmers, to the heart of the, the uh, farm belt, and running a, um, a workshop, a conference, entitled Improving Nitrogen Use Efficiency in Crop and Livestock Production Systems, Existing Technical, Economic, and Social Impediments. So what is it? We know a lot about how the farmers could improve their nitrogen use efficiency. What's stopping them? Is it the economics? Is it social impediments? Is it lack of trust? Is it lack of knowledge? Um, and so we're getting together people who don't normally come together. This is not going to be your typical uh, gathering of a bunch of scientists. Uh, we're getting people who are, um, <clears throat> uh, who are from uh, Ag agronomic backgrounds in academia, but also people who are extension agents, industry experts, 
uh, people who are practitioners, and we're designing it to have interaction among those, uh, have panels of uh, the practitioners comment on the plenary session that they just heard from of the, uh, the pr pr professors presenting their evidence. So it should be a fun program. And this is, and we have co-sponsorship by fertilizer in, in, industries, um, along with uh, federal grant money um, that we're doing to put this together. So take home messages. We need an integrated, sustainable agriculture and food security uh, at global and national scales. It depends on where you are. If you're in sub-Saharan Africa, it's how to figure out how to get more nutrients uh, in the hands of farmers and how to use them properly. Um, in the developed world, it's how to encourage farmers to use them more uh, efficiently and perhaps uh, uh, less abundantly. Um, this involves smart intensification. It doesn't, and I don't think intensification of agriculture is a bad word. Um, I think it means that we apply our technology and our knowledge in a smart way. We have to reduce food wastage. In some cases that involves technology such as the improved storage bins for, for um, African farmers, um, uh, small scale farmers I should say, um, but it also means uh, reduced food wastage at the dinner table, and modifying our dietary habits. Um, now, I'm often asked, oh, isn't that just a pipe dream? I mean, come on, get real, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, McDonald's puts their Happy Meal thing, they get the children hooked on it early on. Um, but, you know, I would remind you that um, if, again, we go back to the 1970s when we all thought we were eating enough meat, um, I bet you, um, I'm not sure what the regulation here would have been. I wouldn't have been a bit surprised if somebody would have been lighting up a cigarette during my lecture here in the 1970s. We certainly would have gone out there afterwards and had cigarettes um, uh, afterwards. And that's a matter of a few decades. And human habits do change. And uh, so while it seems kind of insurmountable to think that Americans would ever go for smaller portion sizes of meat. Um, well, we did go for fewer cigarettes. And um, I think in the case of cigarettes, science and communication of science played a big part of it. And I think science and communication of science was going to play a big part dealing with climate change, dealing with nitrogen pollution, dealing with biodiversity. It's essential that we invest in science, in the communication of the science, and present that to decision makers and policy makers, and all of you are decision makers and policy makers. And I will add that I think there's a cookie reception afterwards, <laughs> and remember that sweets were among the lowest on the ranking of the you know, input. So you can go out there and enjoy your cookies and not feel the least bit guilty. And thank you for your attention.